that's um, the biggest question and therefore the most difficult. So it'll take <clears throat> a little bit to explain how I approach that, that problem. I think if you had a very strong theoretical uh, commitment, a dogmatic one, a Marxist one, say, you could, you could easily point to certain factors that would be the key causal um, factors. Um, and similarly, if, if one took an economic approach, uh, a more conservative one, we would have a similar, similar kind of causal network. But of course, we know that, that it's very difficult to pinpoint one single causal factor. If you look at a, maybe the most important technology of the last century, the digital computer, we know that, that it was um, born of, of military investment and required a huge, huge amount of both capital as well as personnel during the Second World War. <clears throat> then we also have to admit that technologies often appear as the result of innovative thinking. So again, with the computer, whether it was Alan Turing in Britain, Konrad Zuss in, in Germany, we would also want to point to the sort of individual um, intellectual factors as well. <clears throat> so soon we would get, I think, a fairly, a fairly um, Catholic, let's say, position historically to say that we would have to point to many factors that would, that would work to, to explain technological innovation. But I think that's very unsatisfying. It's, it's not satisfying because we lose sight of what actually is technology in itself. What is it? How does it work? Um, and we have to think that very carefully. And it's also dangerous, I think, because that historical kind of bland approach that points to multi-causal factors um, also assumes a certain technical neutrality. It assumes that technology is, in fact, a somewhat neutral instrument for many different, uh, employed by many different purposes and for, for different kinds of, of reasons. So I think we really have to think technology in itself without committing to a dogmatic formula that says this particular external factor is what, what determines it. So I think this is why we, we could look back without at all um, committing to a Heideggerian perspective. We can look back to Heidegger's very important essay, a Question Concerning Technology, to see that the question he was posing was absolutely important. We have to think technology in its own terms. What is the essence of technology? And I think we also can follow him without all of his implications by pointing to the fact that technology, um, understood in the way that you asked this question, what are the drivers of technology, assumes a certain kind of uh, thinking about causality, that something causes something else. Obviously taking, taking his cue from Aristotle, but I think what's most important for me is, is his pinpointing the fact that a technology is a making, it's an artificial process. It's a human process of making. So techne is poesis, as he says. And, and once we think about it in that way, we realize that technology will always be something more than just its material form or its use value. It also has a purpose. Now, this, I think, is important for, for at least two reasons. Uh, the first one is that, as he shows in this essay, we cannot separate a technical object from its social context or its religious context or its, um, def you know, the def what defines its purpose but we also can't separate it from its material forms either. These are all constraining uh, dimensions. But I think what, what I take from Heidegger is the idea that the technical object has an independent existence because it brings all of these different factors together into one organization. And what makes it a technical object is its internal coherent technical organization. So the um, second implication of that is that technology as an independent organization has the capacity to develop and evolve on its own. In other words, technologies can evolve beyond their initial appearance in various systems or, or social contexts or political or economic contexts. What I would first want to say is that if we look at the long history of technology, right from the origin of the human as a tool maker through important revolutions um, in technology such as writing and the printing press and so on, we can see that, that that we cannot um, isolate technology from the history of the culture of the human. Not only is technology obviously in, entangled in the sense that social political systems require technologies in order to, to maintain themselves, in order to organize, but they also have a direct and very strong influence on the way that humans think. And this is something that's often, I think, left outside of these more sociological approaches to technology, is that it is not simply that a human mind uses a tool such as the pen 
to make records and, and then perhaps could use the technology in another way, is that the human mind is formed through its technologies. So these very important revolutions in, in the history of technology, let's say the invention of writing as, a, as co-instantiated with the history of the origin of the state, is also the origin of a whole new way of thinking. So unlike any other being, the human is the site of multiple instantiations, multiple individuations. So a theory of creativity, and this is something that my own work is actually organized around, um, uh, is, is something that must pay attention to the intrinsically artificial character of the human, its dependence on what we might call automatic systems, or at least systems that have a certain kind of automaticity. And to think of creativity then not as a spiritual freedom or a, uh, where insight somehow is something somewhat mysterious or miraculous, but to emphasize uh, instead concepts such as interruption, error, and slippage. And these are the, the words that I've been using in my own work. That what makes the human in incredibly rich in potential is the ability to slip between these systems, or in fact to put systems into a way, uh, into relationships that are, that are not predetermined by the automatic operation of the system itself. Error, the straying from the norm, is, opens up possibility. Interruption, which is to not so much escape automaticity, but to, but to slow it down or to, or to pause. Um, and also the slippage, the slippage between different ways of thinking about um, our worlds, given that our, our psyche is in some ways a site for these multiple individuations or identities. What we have to say is, um, against Heidegger, is that humans do not have a way of life, a way of thinking outside of technology. So the idea that somehow modern technology is an infringement on something more purely human, more natural, as his many examples show, I think is, is um, a mistake philosophically, but also a danger again. So what I've been interested in lately is drawing on theorists who are writing around the same time as Heidegger after the Second World War, and really taking seriously the idea of the evolution of technology. Not the evolution of social economic systems and their technologies, but the evolution of technology. So um, one of the thinkers we could point to, not extremely well known, but a, a, a famous demographer as well as evolutionary theorist, Alfred Lotka, writing in, in 1945, explains that humans evolve in two ways. One, through their genetic, long, slow evolution, like any other animal. But they also evolve quite rapidly through the appearance of what he calls artificial technologies, artificial extensions of human capacities. And this he calls exosomatic evolution. In other words, the evolution outside the body. The best example is the digital revolution, <clears throat> not just because of its technical brilliance or the, the, the amazing sublime performance of network computing, um, but, but for, for quite a different reason. First of all, there's no question that the digital technologies have been more disruptive in the sense of transforming their, their, um, uh, their networks of organization more rapidly so one thing that we have to take into to account is the extreme speed of the digital revolution. Now that speed is not just like equivalent or parallel analogous to other technical revolutions, which also have been very disruptive, or maybe that's a negative word, but have been profoundly transformative um, and, and had lots of effects. What's different about the digital revolution is that it's not simply one technology that has evolved in a particular context and maybe develop new implications. It has spread and embedded itself in every single layer and every single system of the human world and the natural world, we could also um, add. So, so that's quite different than technical systems in earlier epochs, the Industrial Revolution, the invention of writing, printing, what have you, where clearly the technology had profound transformative effects in different spheres but often we could track those relationships much more directly. And also there were places where they were kept at least separate. The logics were separate. So printing affected religion, but, and, and maybe profoundly transformed it, but religion still had a kind of separate organizational sphere. 
Um, so the tool was used by religion, but of course religion also used the tools and there was this kind of symbiotic relationship. Now what's different in the digital revolution is, is not so much that it has spread, but that the digital technologies now organize all of the systems and not just all the systems at the level of, you know, your banking or what have you, but even the most intimate spheres of human existence. So when I say about the system, it's not even just social systems, but actual um, individual psychic systems. It's that those technologies, the digital technologies, are, are, are different in an alien kind of way and that they are now defining and perhaps even, let's say, transforming the logic of those systems into, let's say, digital systems. So what does that mean? Well, first of all, if we again pay attention to the fact that this has a profound effect on the way that we think, that technologies have a profound, way, a profound effect on the way that we actually think as cognitive beings, that digital is different, not only because it directly affects our mind in so many ways, but it does it so persistently. Unlike the pen, you could argue the computer is always with us, or at least it's something that, that, that we're facing in an intimate way uh, for longer and longer periods of time. That, that is clearly important, uh, but it also is in hidden ways. So if you say that we individuate different systems by habituating ourselves in, in the world in many different ways, even if we're not interfacing with a computer screen, the systems themselves are organized by, by digital technologies. So every time we interface in different ways uh, in the world, every, every time we, we perform these different habituations, they're governed by the logic of the digital. And this is again happening not by humans putting things together, but the digital technologies themselves are what facilitate exchange and organization. So when we say that the logic of the digital has actually infected, let's say, different systems of society, the psyche, um, uh, so society itself, politics even, we mean that, that it has become necessary to organize those, those spheres in relationship to the technologies, just like the writing did in the ancient state. However, it's different in that the political system is tied to the economic system, tied to the psychic system, tied to the, 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 um, the, the cultural industry and so on in ways that have never happened before. And I don't mean tied even in a kind of vague way, but literally connected. So what does that mean for, for the future? It means that more and more the systems, especially since they run automatically and it, in ways that are not really conformable to human action, that these systems become more and more dominant in our lives. But it's not simply, again, an external alien technology. They become more dominant in our lives and therefore are, are, are governing the individuation at all levels. But I think, again, it's underestimating the importance of digital technologies as facilitators of exchange, network, and communication. And this is something early theorists of new media were interested in, that code is in some ways more openly neutral than any other medium because it can translate all the mediums. Friedrich Kittler said the same thing um, in a very prophetic way back in the 80s in, in his book, Gramophone. Um, what's the Gramophone film typewriter? Which is that the modern medium is different because it's capable of essentially translating any medium. So the logic of the, let's say, the organization and flow of information in the digital technology will will encompass all of the media, but also now we, as we see, it encompasses all the different ways that we organize ourselves in human society. One of the ways that we often think about this problem is in the replacement of human beings. So not to, to diminish the importance of this as a, as a reality, but, but conceptually the idea that somehow certain jobs will be taken over by First of all, industrial robots, smarter robots, more flexible robots, which is a lot of the work that's being done now, even at Berkeley, human-friendly robots, for example, that will learn from humans and then replace them. <laughs> learn as in not simply repeating the motions, but actually learn a more flexible, all the things that humans now do on factory assembly lines because of their dexterity. Now that's one of the new important objects of, of robotics. Um, Similarly, if we take, as I said before, one of the most profound revolutions in the last you know, half century has been the emergence of artificial intelligence. We know that certain things can be done by machines. So that 
we we start to hear about certain forms of work also being replaced, let's say, by um, artificial intelligence in the realm of research for sure, but also let's say in yeah, like in the legal field. So the future of work can't be disentangled from the future of let's say politics, from culture, uh, and the future of technology. So the evolution of the digital can accelerate and intensify some of the negative consequences, um, or is intensifying many of those negative consequences. And from the broadest perspective, I would say the negative consequence is one that, that, that does look back to Heidegger to say that often the digital is so good at transforming other systems into ones that are calculable and predictable. Now, the ways that, that computers are capable now of organizing systems and making them coherent, uh, integral, and predictable, automatic, we might say, is very sophisticated and often doesn't look like the old mechanisms of the past. Not only are they often invisible, but often they're also very flexible. So the, 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 the profound achievements of machine learning, deep learning, new forms of, of, of statistical um, modeling that includes both in neurosciences as well as in, 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 in fields like sociology, but also in the fields of econ economic and, and political organization. These are very subtle and flexible and adaptive, but they are still about calculation and prediction. So just the idea of disruption, the idea of novelty, even, even in the case where we can demonstrate that the technology is an evolution for the best in terms of the technology, a faster computer or a more efficient car or what have you, that does not mean that without very careful study that, that these things will necessarily be, be good for the social systems that depend on them. And I think that the best example of that, of course, is the, is the car. The introduction of the automobile and its infrastructure that then becomes a kind of um, metastization of, of, of a kind of social system that, that now serves the vehicle rather than, than in some ways is stabilized by it. So, so that would be my main concern is the, the not, not just that not following the implications, but recognizing that we don't know the implications. Of course, there's also the case that social and other systems are being destabilized by technology that no longer work. So this, this is equally a, a difficulty. So if I was looking for a frame for a solution to that problem, it would be one that, that recognizes that technologies play fundamental roles in many different situations that we're not always aware of. And yet, at the same time, their roles can change. Technology is not neutral, and, and it also has no determinative value on its own. Um, so that means we have to be very careful, I think, first of all, about the idea that technology um, evolving is necessarily good in the sense of biological evolution that, that proves in some ways that something is being tested. Because in fact, in a modern society, often these technologies are not being tested in a, in a kind of neutral field, but in fact are highly, um, uh, as you say, entangled in many different places. So that's to say there's a danger in not evolving and there's a danger in evolving, which sounds unsatisfying. But I think the first step would be to say, what is it that we're trying to, to, to produce at the university or in design schools or in technology firms? And, and the first thing would be to say, recognize that technical evolution is something that, that has an orientation to teleology, but some of the, the entanglements are quite hidden. So this is a way of saying, oh, well, the human then is a special kind of being that requires what we might call programming, requires a certain determination in order for it to become what it is as a thinking subject, as a social subject, an ethical subject, and so on. For me, it's a much more um, important theoretical foundation, which is that the brain is an open system. So that means it's genetically determined as a web of synaptic possibility, but it only becomes what it is through experiencing the world. So this is where I take my cue from thinkers such as uh, André leroy Garon, who's the French paleoanthropologist, and thinkers like, um, like Bernard Stigler, who's taken up leroy Garon's work to argue that what makes a human a human subject is the possibility of exteriorization of thinking and the interiorization of thinking, and in fact those are the same thing. In other words, we can put outside of ourselves our thought and store it in, in organized forms. 
That's what animals are not capable of doing, which is to say we can also interiorize organizations of thinking. And by that, it, it, it allows us to develop as an individual, not simply via the plasticity of our brain, but also by the, what we might call an alien logic within our brain. Literally, we think other people's thoughts. That's what learning is in a cultural or, or human sense. It's not simply observing and imitating, it's actually taking in an alien system of thought. Uh, and this is the one that I think is especially important for, for artificial intelligence, the field of artificial intelligence, and its projection into the, the next decade. And that is the incredible scope and scale of what we now call deep learning, machine learning, the possibility of, of not simply um, collating and organizing data, but actually intelligently discovering new forms of knowledge, let's say new forms of, of new, new concepts, whole new structures that are not only ones that the computer, say, would help us find, but that actually they're finding things that humans cannot even conceive. It's not possible for us even to actually understand them. Um, this is profoundly new, is that we have inhuman knowledge. So no longer are we simply artificially intelligent, but we have sort of machinic processes now that can produce forms of intelligence that are not, let's call them, capable of being interiorized by humans. Which is to say that the logic of our systems, which have always been somewhat opaque to us, I think, as social individuals, as, or even if we think in religious terms, the, the impossibility of knowing really the outside, this is something that we know now to be the case. We know that we're, that we're, being, um, that, that we're, that we're capable of, of producing these systems that create knowledge that is not human. But we also rely on that knowledge. And this is, I think, what's quite new, quite dangerous, and people are beginning to see the dangers of that, which is, what does it mean to rely on knowledge that we ourselves cannot, in fact, understand? That it's not simply black boxes in the sense of, I don't understand how my iPhone works. This is quite new. These systems of machine learning are all predicated, again, on prediction. The idea of uncovering these structures is in order to better predict the performance of the, the world, whether it's humans or machines or the natural world. Um, modeling is a way of extracting a certain kind of structure and then predicting. But what's profoundly insidious about many of these systems is that they are also at once predictive but also prescriptive. In other words, not only do they predict the behaviors, but they will make those predictions come true by themselves and automatically. So this is not a matter of applying a technology anymore. This is really that the systems themselves are now designed and constructed to not only predict, but make prescriptive um, actions to, to create in some ways the, the prophecy that it has made. Now, uh, the, the, the important point here is that in this new era of the digital, the more connected people are through this sort of pseudo collective, the more possibilities of prediction and prescription are going to be um, introduced. And, and that's not simply to mean this kind of alien instrument that will coerce us, a kind of Deleuzean control society, but we will, as individuals, become more amenable to these kinds of prescriptions. Or we will lose the capacity to, to provide these translations and slippages between different spheres. And, and that's really what I would like to kind of um, uh, you know, reduce my, my, my conceptual framework to if I had to, which is to say, the, the real danger of the, the disruptive technology in this Silicon Valley turn, the idea that the introduction of certain digital um, capacities will improve all these operations, the danger is that it co-ops the logic of them, creates more unity, more homogeneity, but not at the collective level of shared human experience, but through solicitations and, and organizations um, derived from the technology itself. So, so this would be to say a new disruptive technology would be training the mind to operate in different ways other than the tool itself. And that's a profound challenge, but I think it's going to be essential for, let's say, the future of education and the future of, as you say, work in, in the next decade. So it's very difficult for us to go back to an older, say, liberal concept of the state that, that reaffirms these values of somehow a kind of um, separation from society in order to steer it. We already have seen a profound 
merging of the social and the political and the economic, and that's accelerating, if anything, today. And we've also seen the evisceration or reorganization of the boundaries of the political, the nation state form, and so on, in not just processes of globalization, but new processes of how uh, new processes of information technology that, that also have transformed those boundaries. But at a very minimum, we have to recognize that the political world is organized in ways that are not completely parallel to what we would call the nation state. That's, that's a given in any sophisticated theoretical world, even though it's not always understood um, at that level. So this would be my, my important, um, well, it's not important, it's important for me, and I think it's an important question, which is to say, uh, not how can we use the political realm, the public sphere, and so on, art to somehow produce new relationships to technology or to resist some of the, the, the more difficult um, uh, implications that we're now, now seeing. That I think is a mistake because we're still operating within older concepts and older vocabularies of the political and the social. We really do have to think about what, I don't mean think about it, but also study, what are the new forms, if, if there are any, what are the new forms of the public that are arising today? And by the public, I mean a place that, whose logic is organized by the common interests, or at least common interests defined in some way, rather than the logic of the economy, the logic of a particular community, the logic of, of administration, what Foucault would call biopower. Is there a new concept of the political for the age of artificial intelligence for the modern technical digital world? Are there places where decisions can be made that are organized in a way that, that is defined by community rather than by the specific logics of, of these algorithmic um, processes? So, so these are not, again, neutral technologies or ones that somehow we respond to, but they build communities. So the real question of the political in the 21st century is going to be, what are the zones, the, the, the lines of division that will, that will really um, be spaces for decisions in this sphere of technology? Because they will have to be made. It's whether they're going to be made automatically by systems or whether they'll be made by true collectives. We seem caught in between a kind of technical dystopia or a kind of reversion to nationalist collective ideas of decision. Um, and technology is producing, I'd say, an acceleration of both of those tendencies. Now, the reason I'm optimistic is I think that it's entirely not only possible, but becoming increasingly clear of, for historians and theorists of the digital revolution that there's, there are alternatives, that automaticity doesn't have to be uh, compared or contrasted only with freedom, for example, or that decision doesn't mean uh, some kind of eruption of the miracle in the way that Schmidt um, at one point de defined it. And that's a very difficult concept, but I'm optimistic that we can think about decision in, in ways that, that reduce the metaphysical kind of um, implications, but also resist the technical evolution of automatic decision making. And, and it will have to be something along the lines of where do we gain access to a logic that that does not define itself in the way that these other systems do. That's a really a difficult question, but I think it's one that is the, the one that we need to ask. Mm -hmm.